Amen. Here's another one for you. Be blessed. Hi guys, this is Ibrahim. Hope you're doing well. I just want to give you a short testimony of what God's done in my life. So uh, I grew up in a very religious background. My dad was Muslim, my mom was Christian. And this led to me having an understanding of God, but I never knew what it meant to be a born again Christian. You know, uh, my dad was in and out of my life. And this led to me being very insecure. He grew up with a lot of invisible scars, a lot of psychological scars. However, nevertheless, my mum will take us church. And one of the factors that really drove me and convicted me was the fact that even though I was young, I was around nine, 10 years old when my mum would take me to church. I knew that if I was to stand before God and I was to die and stand before God, I knew that I wouldn't make heaven my home. I knew I needed the Lord and I knew I needed a savior. And this led to me giving my life to Christ. You know, uh, one of the brothers prayed with me um, said this in his prayer and led me to Christ and once I finished that prayer I felt like a weight was lifted off my shoulder I felt joy I've never felt before and I had the confidence that no matter what happened to me if I was to die that very day I knew that I would make heaven my home if you don't know Jesus Christ I would encourage you give your life to him he's completely transformed my life I don't need to go raving I don't need to take drugs don't need to take alcohol follow the man them um, in order to fit in and please other people. Now my focus has shifted to pleasing God and not pleasing people. Give your life to Christ. You know, knowing Christ is such a joy and one of the reasons it is is because life has a lot of highs and lows, a lot of chapters in life. And um, knowing God, it really helps you navigate the highs and lows and thrive and be the person that he's created you to be. God bless and give your life to Christ. Amen. You heard the man. Give your life to Christ. I mean, I can't emphasize that uh, enough. I can't emphasize the important and the urgency of those words. Give your life to Christ Jesus. Amen. Uh, last month, May, uh, well, obviously, uh, because of lockdown, uh, we were supposed to have Evangelist Jerry Fussell from the United States come and uh, preach a series of meetings for us. And obviously, because of lockdown, he wasn't able to do so. And I was really looking forward uh to this uh series of meetings i'm believing god again once all this clears we'll be able to get him down to tottenham and i know it's going to be a powerful powerful time uh but guess what we've got the man tonight to this morning and uh he's going to minister to us uh really do appreciate him all the way from the united states are uh, doing this for us uh, uh, and i know we're going to hear from god different time zones etc and so forth amen so you listen up open your heart and be blessed amen Praise the Lord. It is uh, good to be back once again. Uh, had a fantastic time Sunday and uh, pray everybody's safe tuning in from their homes. And I want to tell you, uh, God can move and has moved through these times, although uh, I can't wait till we can just all get back together again, put this time behind us, uh, and uh, carry on with the gospel. But uh, I've been hearing reports of people getting saved, uh, filled with the Holy Ghost. Actually, uh, back in uh, uh, January, I was preaching in El Paso before all this kicked off, and I didn't wasn't even aware they were live streaming, and uh, they were videoing it. And uh, during the altar service, uh, someone is watching in Mexico, and the, the the short version is a couple is there, new converts, uh, and uh, the wife gets radically baptized in the Holy Ghost. It said it scared the heck out of her husband because she just went off and it was all quiet until she began to speak in tongues. Uh, anyway, what a powerful thing. That just lets you know we're not in control of this. God's in control. He's totally sovereign. Uh, he's moving in the earth, and we just need to uh, learn to adapt and flow and minister uh, as aptly as we can in these times. If you have your Bibles tonight, I'm going to minister out of the book of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. 
In uh, uh, June of 2019, during our uh, June conference, I, uh, there was a prophecy, and uh, uh, part of that prophecy that I gave is that there was going to be an increase of uh, hatred and uh, uh, things of that nature in the mainstream, in the media specifically, uh, and we've been seeing that, a lot of racial tension, political tension. Uh, we've seen little blips of that against Christianity, you know, every Christmas, they don't want the manger seen on city property, and we're used to that, but uh, the prophecy is that that is going to begin to shift. It's going to begin to change. Uh, probably, uh, the, according to the word that I gave, it would be at the end of this year, uh, where it will begin to very directly come at Christianity, attacking the gospel, attacking the church, attacking individuals, and the message of the gospel itself. We live in a world that is anti-Christ, that is hostile, and they haven't really been doing this, but it's going to begin to turn where they're very directly going to try to marginalize Christianity, those that believe, how exactly all that manifests, I don't know, but I I do know uh, they're coming after us. And so there's much hatred. There's much vitriol taking place in the world. And as I was considering this, uh, I thought it well that we need to really uh, uh, understand and have a biblical world view, a biblical spirit and mindset as believers uh, as uh, this begins to unfold. You know, how do we think? How do we respond? How do we react where everywhere you turn there's messages of uh, hatred against you or even saying things falsely or ridiculing or maligning you? Uh, I believe uh, that it is wise for us uh, to hear the words of Jesus. He gives us wisdom uh, in the midst of uh, this kind of uh, uh, atmosphere. In Matthew 5.43, Jesus says these words, You've heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, or if I could just take a little liberty, that you may be children, because it's man or woman, children of your Father in heaven. Firstly, I want to point out, that God is the author and ruler of times and seasons. Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. In Psalm 104.19, he appointed the moon for seasons. The sun knows it's going down. Daniel 2, blessed be the name of God forever, for wisdom and might are his. He changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and he raises up kings. I'm saying that to tell you tonight that God is in complete control. He's not necessarily causing what's happening in the world to happen today, but he is allowing it, and he's in total sovereign control. To make it clear what Daniel was saying, I 100% believe God put President Barack Obama in the White House. I also 100% believe that God put Donald Trump in the White House. You cannot believe one without believing the other. He raises up kings, he sets some down. Now I know there's a human uh, component that is a part of that, but again, God is in complete sovereign control, and this is what the Bible is telling us. He's in control. Nothing goes on he does not allow. But he doesn't tell us everything that he's doing. He doesn't always give us a heads up and map it all out for us. In fact, many times people came to Jesus. They were asking him, when's the end of the world? When are these things going to be? What will be the sign of your coming? This happened on many occasions. 
One such is on his final departure in Acts 1 when they come to him again. And he says in verse 7, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. There are certain things, listen, you don't need to worry about that right now. That is not really something that God wants to reveal to you right now. And then he told them, but the Holy Spirit will come and he's going to give you power. And so God doesn't show us everything. He doesn't map all of it out. But that being said, God does show us quite a bit of a few things. He reveals many things to us in his word, by the Holy Spirit. One such is in the book of Daniel. Again, I'm flowing from times and seasons to something I'm going to bring up right here. A season that is coming, a time that is coming. It is one of great darkness, and that is the time of the Antichrist. Now, I want to move quickly here because I just want to bring out one aspect of this portion in Daniel. But the scriptures in Daniel 23 through 25. The Bible says, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom of the earth. It'll be different from all other kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. Another shall rise after them. He'll be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. Here's the verse I really want to examine. Verse 25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints will be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Now, it's, that's more the tribulation, and I'm not going to uh, theologically break that down uh, tonight. You can study that later. What I want to bring out is his posture and his spirit that is against the church against Christians and the gospel. We're talking about a world leader that will come on the scene, a new religious political system never seen before on earth. And the Bible says one of the hallmarks, one of the characteristics of that system is going to be hate. Hatred. Hatred of God, hatred of the people of God, that is Christians, and hatred of the Jews and the nation of Israel. The big question, the age-old question again, is when? When will these things be? And I think it's very foolish. Over the years, you see someone trying to predict who the Antichrist is, and, and uh, they're digging into all these weird things. Can I just give you a tip? Stay off of those websites. Uh, just stick to the Bible. Uh, it brings much confusion. It's very interesting to read a prophecy book 20 years after it's been written. I'll just say that. But Jesus was asked the same thing. And Luke is a very important scripture, I believe, especially for us in this time right now. Luke 21, 7. Teacher, when will these things be? What will be the sign of these things are about to take place? And Jesus said, take heed that you be not deceived. For many will come in my name, saying I am he. The time draws near, therefore don't go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, don't be terrified. All these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. Then he said, nation will rise against nation. And to be the more correct uh, uh, the, in the original language, that's actually talking about racial group against racial group. Black, white, brown, yellow, green, whatever. Uh, it's talking about racial. Then it goes and talks about kingdom against kingdom. So you'll have racial tension, you'll have countries that are uh, against one another, there'll be great earthquakes in various places, there'll be famines and pestilences, this is something we're suffering through right now, pestilence, uh, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. But here we go, here's what I want to zoom in on. Verse 12, but... Before all these things, yes, this is happening now and it's going to kind of segue into the very last times, but before all these things, this means 
before I believe the rapture. They're going to lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You'll be brought before kings and rulers for my namesake. It will turn out for you as an occasion of testimony. Therefore, settle in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you'll answer. For I'll give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. You'll be betrayed by even parents and brothers and relatives and friends. They'll put some of you to death. You'll be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head will be lost by your patience. Possess your souls. I believe this uh, verse can uh, speak ultimately of the end days, but also the last 2,000 years uh, has shown many occasions where Christians have been severely persecuted, imprisoned, and even put to death for their faith. But we're talking about a time where that's not going to be a little isolated incident. It's going to become a worldwide consciousness, a hatred of the gospel, Christianity, of God, and everything that it stands for. So that brings me, secondly, to a season of demonic hatred, a culture of hatred. I believe we are now living in the days just before the time of the Antichrist. Jesus said in verse 12, but before all these things, and he mentions great hatred and persecution. You know, there's always been hatred and bitterness in the world, but I would say not like today on such a worldwide scale. We see this manifesting every day, and it's going to continue to get worse. One of the latest examples being of that which happened to George Floyd. Absolutely evil what happened to him. But also the response across America, the riots, the looting, the violence, that is also evil. See, much of what you are seeing has been highly organized by people who could care less about George Floyd. They have an agenda to change the culture of America from a Christian ethos to one that is anti-Christ in nature. Now this is being recorded and so that was a fancy word for me. You can pause it and look it up uh, and uh, you'll, you'll get it right away. But it is a demonic culture. This is what we're seeing unfold. It's not Republican, Democrat, black, white. Let me tell you, behind all of this violence, all of this spirit of hate uh, is Satan. It is demonic. Demonic hatred has an agenda. and That is to poison mankind. See, Satan isn't wanting people to worship him so he can take care of them. He wants to destroy them. Satan's a thief. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus said the thief doesn't come except to steal, kill, and destroy. See, demonic hatred, if the devil can get us to hate, if he can lure us into the trap of hatred. Now, I'm not talking about being angry. For example, when I saw what happened to George Floyd, I was angry. That was an injustice. But I'm not talking about angry. The Bible does not forbid us being angry. I'm talking when that begins to transition to bitterness and hatred. See, that kind of hatred has a way of spreading like a virus. Because it is. It's sin. See, Satan wants to fill as many people with hatred as he can. You know, I don't usually like to use Hollywood for examples, but uh, in this case, it would serve us well. It's familiar. You know Star Wars. I remember years and years ago when that came out, it was a big thing. George Lucas had really uh, blown the mind of the world and all the special effects he was using. And the, the final scenes of Luke on the bridge and the emperor there as he watches out the floor-to-ceiling windows of all his countrymen being obliterated. They were ambushed. It was a setup. There's nothing Luke can do about it. He's watching out the window as the people he cares about being blown away as the emperor stands next to him. Because he can feel Luke. He's getting ticked. He's getting upset. He, can't, he, he doesn't like this. As the emperor whispers into his ear, he, 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 that's right, let the hatred flow through you. 
Take your lightsaber. Strike me down with it. And your journey toward the dark side will be complete. I want to be clear about something. Christians are absolutely nothing like the make-believe Jedi. Let your feelings be your guide. And no, 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 no. Forget the feelings. We need to live by this. Can you say amen? But there is a truth there that when you live by your feelings, let that hatred, uh, Luke, let it get a hold of you. Let it fill your being. And when you do that, it's going to cross you over to something very terrible. There's a truth there. In Ephesians, Paul says in verse uh, 26 of chapter 4, he says, Be angry, but do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Hatred, anger, bitterness, it opens a door spiritually for Satan. This is a dangerous progression of anger to wrath to bitterness to hatred. Paul says you need to deal with things quickly, lest you give place to the devil. I've seen people do this in their marriages. I've seen people do this in their relationships, on the job, in a church. Yes, there's a violation or something. There's a legitimate cause. But rather than deal with it correctly, there's the emperor. How dare they? Oh, they, they, they you begin to wish terrible things, and instead of dealing with it properly and quickly, you give place to the devil, and he takes you way past what would have been a righteous anger. Now, the next thing you know, you're in darkness, hating and bitter. But I want to close with some good news. Because though the world goes the path of the dark side, we are children of the light. Can you say amen? And I believe we are about to see the greatest revival human history has ever seen the likes of. And I believe very possibly one of the reasons that's going to be is it's going to be so dark, it's going to be so dim that the light of the church is going to shine as if it never has before, like a city on a hill. In Joel chapter 2, I can't read it all for time, but he begins to uh, list off a progression for a last day's revival. First, sound an alarm. Let all the inhabitants of the earth, let people know Jesus is coming. There's going to be an awakening that, you know what, eternity is coming. The world is not going to carry on as business as usual forever. Uh, an end is coming. A judgment is coming. Sound an alarm. He says for the church to repent, to turn to him, fasting and weeping. And in the midst of that, the Bible says he's gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great kindness. Here's the difference between Satan and God. Even though judgment's coming, even though he has to deal with this righteously, he's not full of hate. He's full of mercy. He's slow to anger. He's of great kindness. And the whole reason for this is that people would turn to him, repent, where he would readily, speedily, and absolutely forgive them. But how's that going to happen if the church is bitter? When people have been calling you a Jesus freak or saying all kinds of things about your church or about your family or about your loved one, attacking your gospel, I just, you know, this just popped into my head. You're probably watching this online. Let me tell you, there's trolls out there that are going to make a comment somewhere. And I just want to caution Christians, uh, you know what? Uh, the comment section, uh, comment section in YouTube videos is not the place to have a theological argument. Let them go. I call them revival gnats. It's like... You're not going to fix them. They don't even put their real name. You have no idea who it is. Just let it go. It's there to get under your skin. Don't let it do that. But what it does, though, it ticks you off, doesn't it? They say something about your church, about the sermon that was just preached, or about someone, something in you. Well, I'm just righteously indignant. Well, yes, I, I get that. But see, if you're always righteously indignant, you might have a hard time communicating the love of God to people. I'm just saying. You know, in John 
13.34, we see something powerful. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, we'll all know that you're my disciples, if. That can be a big if right there. It's not guaranteed. By all this, the world will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Not how powerful you pray. Not even raising the dead. It's interesting. When they see you raise the dead or heal the sick, man, they're going to know. Now, I believe that is a great sign and validation of the gospel. Absolutely. But of all the things Jesus chose, of all the hallmarks, attributes, or signs that he said the world will really know your mind... I I might just tell you to consider this. Walk into any of our churches and look at the diversity. That's love. And when I say the word love, I I feel that I have to deprogram some of you right now because you're thinking about the scene on the Hollywood movie. This is where the music comes in. I love you, man. You know, no, no, no. Love's when you've been offended. You have a beef, but because of love... Even though you don't feel like it, even though your physical feelings might be contrary, love says, but I'm going to do the right thing and I'm going to reconcile and try to get that healed. When the world sees that, they're going to say, man, that's different. 1 John 4, 7, beloved, let us love one another for loves of God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love doesn't know God for God is love. It doesn't matter how hateful the world gets. And friend, it's going to get bitterly hateful. It doesn't matter. The church, Christians, we cannot go down that path of hate. No matter how justified you feel, we can't do it. The only way we can love like that Okay, let me say, the only way I can love like that, because my name used to be Payback Jerry. You get me, and I will get you back tenfold. Not if I get you first. It doesn't come natural, I have found. Oh, you can fake it for a little bit. But until it really begins to assault you, until you really begin to feel the contrary effects, you're going to need something supernatural, friend. And this is one of the reasons I think God lets it happen, is you can't con this. You can't fake it. 1 Timothy 1.5 says, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, from a sincere faith. It says, from which some strayed have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things they affirm. We're back to the comments section in YouTube. Rebel spirits, people that don't have love, they always get caught up in foolish arguments. Some doctrine, some little verse they found. uh, And uh, when you see that, what the Bible is telling you is love isn't there. It's foolishness. You can tell when a Christian's straying because they begin to have those foolish arguments. Something I also want to tell you is that Christians can love God, love people, and hate sin at the same time. A lot of people get confused here. But let me give you an example. Everyone has a friend, a family member, or someone they know that has an abuse problem. Alcohol, drugs, Something along those lines. I submit you can love the person, but you hate the substance that's destroying them. You love the person, you're hoping uh, to help them, and most people are successful until time goes by and you keep suffering, getting ripped off, getting hurt, getting lied to. Now you don't just hate the substance anymore. You hate the person too. This is where God's different. He never, say that, never stops loving the person. Ever. Never. You mean at the worst? You mean people that did? That's right. Never. Think of the worst person you can think of. God loved them all the way to the end. He never stopped. Now, because he's righteous, it doesn't mean they can go to heaven or he can just overlook everything, but he loved them 
This is where God is different. I even still have a hard time wrapping my head around it. But I believe people were drawn to Jesus because of this. Look at his sermons. He preaches more on hell and money than anybody in the New Testament. Everybody's favorite subject. I know people that go to church, money's never mentioned, and they still say, all they want is your money. Which I don't see how that, no one charged you to get in. But anyway, the scripture makes this clear that Jesus loved people. You know, the Old Testament law had a lot to say about leprosy. It's a curse. It's a judgment. It's unclean, right? A man came to Jesus. He's got leprosy. He wants to be healed. And the Bible says that Jesus looking at him, the Holy Spirit puts this here. Most people wouldn't even think he's a person. Don't even, you know, don't even look. But the Bible says Jesus looking at him loved him. I would submit Jesus that was probably the only one that loved that man at that point in time that day. I could be wrong. There could be family out there, but they're not mentioned. No one else is around. He seems isolated in his gross condition. Do you feel isolated tonight? Has sin isolated you? Is there a vice or something? Is it hatred that you have so been overcome by this? You literally have no one in your life. Can I tell you something right now? You do have someone. Jesus. I don't care how gross you think your sin is, how far gone you think you are. Jesus loves you. The Bible again and again, Jesus moved with compassion for people. And God commands us as Christians to love him and love people. Our text says, you've heard that it's said to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you to love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Is that what you do when someone flips you off going down the highway? Lord, just bless that person right there. I tell people, that's why I don't put bumper stickers on my car because I don't flip people off, but I've honked my horn a time or two. We must repent, church, of anything that would hinder this. Bitterness, offenses. You know, the Bible says in Matthew 18, excuse me, that famous parable where the servant owes a gazillion dollars. There's no way he could pay it back in a thousand lifetimes. He says, Master, have patience with me. I'll pay you all. This is like someone that makes $100 a week. They owe $10 million. You know, I'll pay you back 20 bucks a month. You know, forget it, man. You're buried. It says, but the master was moved with compassion. He saw a man's guy. And he released him. He said, you know what? Forget it. I forgive you. That same guy goes out and finds someone that owes him tens bucks and has him thrown into prison. Now, you want to tick God off. Jesus is showing us this parable. When the king heard about that, he said, you know what? Go get that guy. And when they brought him in, he says, listen, man. You owed me a gazillion dollars, man. There's no way you could have ever paid it back. And I hear you go out. You find someone that owes you 10 bucks. You've had them thrown into jail. I mean, you have a right. That is the law. But shouldn't you have shown some compassion having just been forgiven such an, an insurmount of a debt? There was no way you could pay it back. You wicked servant. And he had the man cast into outer darkness. Now, I'm not going to elaborate on that, but I think you know what that means. See, love has a powerful, powerful impact on the human heart. But you can't fake it, friend. You can't just say, well, I'm a Christian, and yeah, you can't fake this. You've got to get a hold of God and have him in your life. But it is powerful. And I'm going to close here with a, a story. In September of 2018 may be familiar, an off-duty police officer by the name of Amber Geiger. She's returning home from a 20-hour shift. She's wiped out after that shift. She gets off on the wrong floor of her apartment building. She walks into what she thought hurt was her apartment, but it was the apartment of Botham Jean. She mistook him as a threat, and she fatally shot him. She killed the man in his own apartment. 
Of course, that made national news, and she's a white woman cop. He's a black man, and unfortunately, we have people uh, uh, that want to really stir the pot in that. She's taken to trial. She's found guilty. She's going to prison. As you can imagine, there's a lot of emotion here. The uh, uh, man's brother, his name is Brant. When this happened, he's filled with hatred. You see interviews prior to the trial that he was bitter at this woman. He says at one point he even wanted harm to come to her, bad things. He's a believer. He's a Christian. But the lady shot his brother. I think some of that might have been influenced by some of the stuff that was being stirred and, uh, uh, you know, all the emotion. But something began to happen during the trial as he's observing her posture, her brokenness. He seemed to believe she was so regretful of uh, the pain of that. She knows she's taken a life, uh, just a very drastic mistake. She's found guilty. And after that, they have what's called the sentencing phase of the trial. It reminds me of when we're all standing before God. The Bible says the great white throne when you die. If you die in your sin, you're going to hell, but there's going to be something decided there. Books are going to be opened. You're going to stand before the judge. And those books are going to testify about you. They're going to testify about the life you live, sins you committed. I don't know. But I know that it's going to be brought out. And this man, Brant, it's come his turn. Family gets up. Many family were still very angry at the woman. They're saying, throw the book. They want the maximum time. You know, they had a right to be angry. But I think some of them allowed that dark side to get a hold of them. It had turned to bitterness. It had turned to venom. But then, the man's brother, Brant, takes the stand. And as you watch this, I want you to keep in mind, this is not Hollywood. This is not scripted. It's not a skit. This is an actual trial deciding the fate of this woman's life. He takes the stand, and he begins to give his testimony and his view on things and I won't say any more I think it speaks well of itself let's watch this as Brent begins to address the court tonight a powerful scene in a Texas courtroom a man whose brother was shot to death by a Dallas police officer forgiving his brother's killer and embracing her if you truly are sorry I know I can speak for myself. I, I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. I personally want the best for you, and I, I wasn't going to ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you, because I know that's, what, that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I'm not going to say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can can I give her a hug, please? Please? Yes.
praise the Lord. Let's bow our heads tonight. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That was the cry of Jesus on the cross as they're mocking him. They've tortured him. They've beat him. And now they're mocking him. If you're really God, come down off the cross. The Bible says he could have had them destroyed. Legions of angels were standing ready in heaven. I've heard it said, and I believe there's truth there. The nails didn't hold him on the cross. Love did. Because it was the only hope for you and I. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness for sin. It was Jesus' righteous blood that paid the penalty of sin for you and I. And I wonder if you're under the sound of my voice, you're watching now. God is there to meet you right where you're at. If you would like to open your heart, say, you know what, I'm tired of the way I've been living. Maybe you've been bound in bitterness and hatred. Maybe you've been hated by others and you've been affected by that. Now, the love of God is grabbing a hold of your heart right where you're at. God is meeting you right there watching this online and I want to lead you in a prayer. I want you to open your heart and invite Jesus into your heart right now. I want you to pray, Lord God, I admit I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me for all of my sins. Come into my heart right now. I give my life to you. Continue, show me who you are. I want to live for you and serve you. I thank you for dying for me and that you rose again from the dead. Change my life, Lord. Change my heart. I want to be like you. If you prayed that prayer tonight, there's going to be information in the description of the video or on your screen. I want you to go there. I want you to fill that out. Let us know that you accepted Christ so we can pray for you and minister to you. And I believe God will help you tonight. I want to just say a quick prayer for the church believers tonight. You know, maybe you've watched this. What a powerful moment in that courtroom. When I watch that, I have to confess, tears begin to flow. A man embracing his brother's killer. Not only that, saying, I wish you didn't even have to pay the penalty. I wish you didn't have to go to jail. I want you to have a good life, friend. You can't fake that. That man's a believer. He had Jesus in his heart. That's how he got to that spot. He didn't do it because it was a rule. He didn't do it because, well, that's what we're told to do. No, 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 friend. That, you can't do that. He knows somebody. I don't want to put words in his mouth. I don't know the man, but I know mankind. I know myself. Sometimes when I want to get bitter at someone, God will take me back to myself. How many times he's been patient with me. How many times he's forgiven me some of the grossest sin that I have done in my life. And yet, unreluctantly, he forgave it in a moment of time. Maybe there's something you need to let go of tonight. Yes, you might have a right. Yes, maybe even legally you're right. But that's not the issue tonight. Justice is in God's hand. That woman got justice. But as for us, we should have the heart that that man had. God, forgive them. They know not what they do. Lord, like you forgave me, I want to forgive those that have hurt me. I want to let go of the bitterness. I don't want to be like the spirit of the world. I want to be free. Pray this prayer. God, I forgive all those that have hurt me and sinned against me. I'm asking you tonight to fill my heart with your grace and love, I cast out all bitterness and hatred. Lord, I'm making a decision tonight. I'm not going down that path of hate, but I'm going to follow you and I'm going to serve you and I'm going to love people like you love people. I'm asking that in Jesus' name, amen. 
If you prayed that, I believe there's people even right now, God is healing you in your body. Right now, the pain is going. Right now, you've had a condition in your blood. That condition is going right now. Supernatural healing. Some of you have not been able to sleep at night. Right now, there is a peace coming upon you. In fact, your whole home tonight, you're going to sleep like a baby because you have shut the door to the devil. You have cast him out tonight. You're covered with the blood of Jesus. He can no longer come and rip you off, rip off your peace, rip off your joy, rip off your sleep. You need to continue in that, so make sure you're back in church. Next time the doors are open or it's online, however it goes, you've got to keep that connection. If you don't keep that connection, you're going to end up wandering back or falling back in to that old sin. But I don't believe you're going to do that. I believe you're going to see victory and breakthrough, and God is going to move for you in a powerful way. I want to th thank you for tuning in. Amen. Uh, powerful. Um, and I can't emphasize enough what he said there. Um, listen, folks, only Jesus. Um, you can march. You can uh, make reforms. and You can do all these things which in and of, of themselves are not bad. I want to tell you something, only Jesus. There's many things just deal with a symptom. Jesus goes straight to the root. And the root cause of all is sin. And only Jesus can deal with sin. I want to challenge you, join with us tonight. Um, we're going to have a great service. God really is moving. He's moving, he's moving, he's moving, he's moving. Um, amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us online today. We hope that God has ministered to you and your family and you are all refreshed from the Word of God. If this was your first time joining with us, we'd like to welcome you. If you said the prayer at the end of the service, we'd like to congratulate you and encourage you to get in touch with Pastor Yusuf or the team here at the Potter's House Tottenham with the contacts below. We regularly post updates, so if you'd like to stay connected, then hit that subscribe button, turn the notification on, and give us a thumbs up. We hope to see you again at our regular services listed below. Until then, stay safe and God bless.